Julian, welcome to the podcast. It is incredible to have you here. Thank you, Jeff. I'm really, really happy to be here with you. So, of course, so many people are going to know you as the voice of Wyborn and Griffin across 12 stories from Jordan L. Hawk. Wyborn? <laughs> <laughs> like that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually one of people's favorite characters is Christine, even though some people say, well, she's too nasally this time. So I'm like, I, I try and be aware of those things. Time passes. People yeah. might get more nasally over time, right? I, right? Well, I definitely can. I'm from <laughs> Buffalo originally, so we're very nasal there. <laughs> Tell us the origin story. How did you get involved with Jordan to become the voice of this series? Well, the way it happened was I am a member of the Screen Actors Guild, and they were having this kind of workshop seminar about narrating audiobooks when it was still fairly new. And I went to this thing. I thought, well, that sounds kind of interesting because I've always like played with voices and things. I, I love doing that. And there was a guy named Scott Breck who was you know, one of the biggest audiobook narrators there is in the business. He, he's done literally thousands of books. And there were people from Audible there running this workshop. And they said at one point, can we have some volunteers come up and you can try and see what you think and we'll, we'll critique you. So I, of course, I <laughs> raised my hand and I went up there and and I did it. And they said, you know, that's pretty good. And I realized that I really, really liked it. I then went on the Audible site and there, there's a place where you can join as a narrator and then you just start looking for projects and you audition for projects. You send in, a, you know, a, like a three minute audition piece that the that the author or the publisher puts up that you can then audition to. And I came across Jordan's first book of Wittershins of the series and one of the things I really, really liked about the book when I was reading about it was that it was about a couple that was, well, they weren't quite a couple yet. You know, they were they were about to meet, but it was there was a real romance there. And I tend to be more romantic than I am just anything else that way. And I've been in a relationship for a long time and the characters kind of reminded me of us. And so I thought, well, I'm going to try for this. And it was an interesting deal because, you know, it was kind of an experiment for Jordan looking to see, like, if people could really bring this book to life, because there were so many different, really, the, the characters were, there was like this variety of characters. And I thought, well, I can do that because <laughs> I just love, you know, creating characters. And I sent in the the audition. The, there wasn't like pay up front. It was like, do this basically gratis, and then you split whatever the income is that comes in from the book. And I thought, well, you know, I'll do that. And so we did the first book. And, you know, I don't think I did that great of a job with it. I was actually shocked when he hired me and said, you know, yeah, let's do this. But, you know, there are steps like you have to once you agree to do it, then you have to do like the first 15 minutes of the book and the author has to approve that or the publisher, whoever you're working with. And so there are steps along the way so that they make sure that they're happy with what you're doing. But it was also this kind of deal where I had to actually record it as well. And I am like, you know, when it comes to. <laughs> When it comes to technology, I just can't, I can't do, I, I mean, I can function, I can do the computer and everything and set this up. But beyond that, I, I just don't, I, I wouldn't know how to start recording and editing mm -hmm. an audio book. I'm much better at the creative, you know? <laughs> so, so I enlisted a friend of mine who was like, had won an Emmy in sound design for Cosmos. And he said, oh, I'll help you with it. But then he got busy. So then I brought in, asked my partner if he would help because he's also from entertainment business. He's a director and a writer, producer. So I brought him in and it, it was really trial and error, you know, that kind of thing. And I wasn't really completely sure of myself, which is, you know, when I first heard it, I thought, 
yeah, you know, <laughs> this is not really great, but it's not going to get any better. So, and then people who, you know, listeners who, who heard the book, you know, a lot of people didn't really didn't like it. And I understood, but also like when I listened to it the first time, I realized that there was also a lot of that character there in what I had done, that uncertainty, because he was, you know, Wyborn was so uncertain about everything in his life. And he felt so out of place and such an oddball and all those things that it actually worked for the character. Mm -hmm. And the more people listened to the work, you know, beyond the first book and that, the more they people would say to me, nobody else could do these characters but you. You are these characters. And that, you know, that you can't give me a better compliment than that. Right. It's really quite wonderful. So I I guess that, you know, there was enough success from the first book that, you know, Jordan was happy that we went on to do the rest. And 11, actually 12 books later. Yeah. Yikes. 11 novels and a short story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And I really miss them already because I know them so well. It's like they're real to me, mm -hmm. you know. They're real people that, you know, I don't sit around in my living room and talk to, but, <laughs> you know, they, they, they are just as real to me as, as anybody I know. Mm -hmm. They are so fleshed out because the writing was so good. From the element of, that you've performed them now for so long, how, how do you feel like their trajectory is gone as, as a storyteller? across 12 books. You know, as the books went on, they became more about the action, you know, than about the intimate relationship because it's it's almost I, I mean the sexual relationship. Yeah. The intimate relationship obviously is there throughout the whole thing in the way they communicate and interact, but as far as the sexual it became less and less about that. Mhm. Mm which is good, I guess. I, I'm a fan of Harper Fox. Mm -hmm. And, of course, I'm forgetting the name of it now. The one about the detective and the boyfriend who is, uh, or now husband, who is a psychic. Mm -hmm. And I, I've listened to about five of them. I'm more of an audiobook person now because I do them. And I have I love the characters. I think they're really, really interesting. But, you know, it's... I'm I'm curious to see. I know I'm talking here a lot, but you know, I, I when I look at the the gay community, I see so much of our identity disappearing. It, you know, becoming more homogenized into society. You know, even like neighborhoods and things like something that specific, down to just little little more subtle things. And that kind of troubles me a little bit because I don't want young gay people to forget where we come from, mm -hmm. you know, that we, there was a struggle and there's still a struggle ahead of us, but there was a struggle to get where we are. And, and in that sense, it's wonderful to, to read Wyborn and Griffin because they, they've dealt with some of those struggles for sure. But there, there's also this kind of fantasy quality to the books that allows them, you know, in a Victorian era to be and do the things they want. I mean, there's the the books are about outcasts, you know, mm -hmm. one way or another, the oddballs and the nerds, the whatever you want to call them, which is what makes it so wonderful because they all find each other. I, I, I mentioned to you before we started that I host a podcast that's called Talking About Our Generation, which is about baby boomers. And the reason I'm bringing it up is because there's something that I talked about there and people said, well, you know, what 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 was it about Woodstock? Well, you know, when we, we did a thing on the 50th anniversary of Woodstock and I actually tried to get there with a friend. We were very young in a car and we were like eight hours away, couldn't get there. There were so many cars on the road, but it was this <laughs> kind of compelling f feeling that you needed to be with people who were like you, you mm -hmm. know, who were not of the norm, if you will, 
and not that Woodstock was a big gay gathering, but it was for people who just felt different about the world. I grew up in a really industrial city where that was like not okay. So you were constantly searching for like-minded people. Yeah, it's why I think even even now all the strides that we've made, why why Pride Month is still so important to to have the parades and to have the gathering and to have the that larger sense of community. Yeah, what you know, however that is represented, you know, and there's a lot of things now that you know there's some, some parts of our community that are very ultra, you know, who just like they want. They, they, there's one element of the community who doesn't want that element of the community to be kind of part of it anymore because it's it's tarnishing their new view of what they want to look like as gay people. But all of that, whether you're a part of that community, is the community, you mm -hmm. know, of people who struggled to get where they they are now, you know, to give all these freedoms that people have and to be able to have audiobooks that deal with you know lgbt love relationships or yeah. sex or whatever it is or coming out you know and who would have thought that would have even been here like 15 years ago exactly you know? right and i and like how jordan captures it in these books because i mean even in this most recent book there are scenes where Wyborn and Griffin either pull back from each other or quickly change their behavior because they're about to maybe be seen in a more intimate moment. Because they are, despite it being kind of urban fantasy, alternate reality, they still live in a Victorian era where, you know, their behavior and their relationship would not be taken well. Exactly. Like when they're walking out on the street. And I think it was the one scene where they're in Boston, I think, and they wanted to reach out to each other more mm -hmm. when they're driving on the wagon to to get to Widdershins through Boston and and they can't show how they feel towards each other. And, you know, people don't really know what that's like unless they've gone through it. Right. You know, that you can't show that. Of course, you know, back in that era two people just didn't show it, period. Right. You know? Exactly. <laughs> you know, nobody showed it. You know, it just was not acceptable. What was your impression of the world they inhabit when you first encountered it, like when you were deciding to go and, and submit the audition? I loved it. You know, the environment that Jordan creates, you know, it's always rich. Mm -hmm. it, it's rich and full. So which is what makes a good writer, you know. I'm still learning that in my writing, you know, the importance of creating that environment that your characters are living in, because it's not just about what they think and do, you know, it's how all those things around them influence them. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, you get the sense like when you go into the Ladysmith, you know, the museum, you, you, you totally get a sense of, you can smell that it's old. You can, you can hear the echo in the hallways. You can feel the old wood that's, holding the that's making up the exhibit cases and all that i mean it's just it's full of the things that are stored that are weird and bizarre that no other museum has you know right it, it's kind of cool across the 12 books what would you say some of your most challenging moments have been to portray in there oh my god uh well sometimes george will just like pack in like 15 characters into a scene you know? <laughs> and they all have different voices and i'm like oh my god how am i gonna do this i would have to switch between voices and and that's like a whole different person it's almost like you have to be partially schizophrenic or something <laughs> and you know hear voices so that you can get 15 different characters in I, I think most of the time I did a good job with that. There were times when it was uh, excruciating to try and switch between the characters. And sometimes I would forget, you know, it's like, who, who, no, wait a minute, who is this? You know, and, and then I would have to go back and, and do it, which is great about recording that you get to go back and fix stuff if it needs to. And, you know, sometimes you don't get the voices quite right and you, when you listen to it, you go, oh, I don't really like that. So we need to go back and do that. And it can be, like I said, sometimes it can be a grueling process because one of the things that make Jordan's book so great is all are all these characters. But 
it's also a huge challenge to try and, well, not only do do the voices, but figure out, well, what are these voices going to be, you know, and how do you make them sound at least a little bit different enough so that people recognize that somebody else is talking? Mm-hmm. Because it's not always clear who, who, you know, if you just do this kind of monotone read through, you're not giving them a world, you know, mm-hmm. of, of people, which is what is the, the, it enriches the whole process so that when they put down the listening, you know, take the earbuds off or whatever, and you want them to go, wow, that was like, I felt like I was there. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there are some series that I can't just read the book i need the audio because the the narrator has infused so much into that audio world that it's like i don't want to just read the book and leave it to my brain to figure it out i want to hear them do it i agree and i think also there's the other side of it too where i mean there are people i know who just like would pick up one of my audiobooks and hate it and leave it and i know that experience because i i listen to a lot of audiobooks and sometimes like I, I listen to the samples that they put up on Audible. Like some people, I think, why did they choose that narrator? You know, mm-hmm. because this is not the right narrator for this piece. There's a lot of books that I would love to narrate, but I also know that narration is based on what you sound like. I don't sound like Edward Herman, who does like historical books, and he's so brilliant at doing them. The one good thing that I have is that I can do a lot of different voices, but, you know, most audiobooks they don't want you to do a lot of characters. They just want you to just have an inflection so that you know that somebody else is reading it. I'm, I'm reading, a, I don't know his name, but I'm listening to this book right now called Angle of Repose. It's written by Wallace Stegner. And at first when I was listening to it, I thought, I don't know if I can listen to this guy for 22 hours. And I was thinking about like sending it back. And and I thought, well, you know, just give it a little more time. And now I can't imagine anybody else doing this book but this guy. I Mm -hmm. mean, he's just he's that good. So sometimes you have to like, you know, give it a chance. Give the person a chance to find their footing because always the beginning of the book is always a little bit not quite what it's going to be. What's your preparation process like for these books and, you know, dealing with characters and sometimes, honestly, challenging names? Well, first of all, there are basic things that I do with every book, and that is that I I obviously read the book, and as I'm reading it, I color code the book. So each character has its own color, and then I highlight not narration, just actual dialogue. I'll I'll highlight like Wyborn was always a pale yellow color. And so whenever he spoke, his dialogue would come up in pale yellow. In the the last number of books, Jordan would label the the chapter by the character who was, you know, narrating. Mm-hmm. that particular part of the story. So I would keep that. I would always highlight the top. So I knew like who the character is that I'm reading in that chapter to keep track of it. And sometimes I would, you know, have to go back over stuff when I was narrating because Wyborn and Griffin are different, but sometimes they would end up like, wait a minute, that's, that sounds like Wyborn and that's supposed to be Griffin. So I'd have to go back and fix it. But so I, I color code everything. And then I have charts like that as I'm reading, I have one that has all the characters with their color codes so that then when I look at the book as I'm reading along, I can look and see, oh, yeah, that's that character. First of all, if they're characters that have recurred over and over again, we keep clips of the voice so that then I can listen to like a 30, 15, 30 seconds of the voice to remember what the voice was that I gave them before. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they don't show up for like two or three books. So right. <laughs> it was really helpful, you know. And if it's new characters, like I have to say the one character that I just really, really did a horrible job on <laughs> was, was some in the beginning was somebody who was Irish. I'm trying to remember. And Irish is not one of my accents. <laughs> I just can't. I mean, I can do British and German and French and all that. But Irish and Scottish are really, they're so distinctive and 
you know, if you can't do them well, you shouldn't do them at all. You know, they're, they're really just that, that tough. I'm trying to remember who Hattie, for example, who's Cockney, you know, I had to just like, I, I, I've done Cockney before, but not Cockney women. So I would have to like, in addition to the reading, I would then do research to find out like, what did these people sound like? And what did they sound like then? Mm -hmm. I'd keep a list of words that I either didn't recognize, you know, because a lot of them were just old English words that we don't use anymore. So, and sometimes they have different pronunciations. So like the way we would pronounce a certain word here, they would pronounce it in England differently. Mm -hmm. It's a challenge, but it's like, it's a fun challenge. You know, all, all work should be that much fun to do as a challenge. You know, it's all about good writing. If the writing sucks, it's really hard to, to give it what it needs because, well, for me at least, because, you know, I'm fairly intelligent. So if I see something that is like poorly written, I, I keep getting drawn into the error of it as opposed to the creation of it, which means I shouldn't do those books, you know. You've got an extensive performance resume. I, I don't know if people who, who see your name on these audiobooks realize that you've got a huge career in TV and film and stage and all this other stuff. What what got you hooked into like going into the performance profession? I got accepted to this program called the British American Drama Academy, which was at Oxford. And I went to study Shakespeare over there. And it was the most amazing experience I have ever had in my life. And and my partner was wonderful because he just said, go, you know, do this, which is what I did. But so then when I found things like audio, I didn't have like I hated doing stage. <laughs> I hated it because the people were right there. And I was like, I don't want to see you. You know, <laughs> so then it was like TV and film because then there's just the crew and all that stuff. But, you know, I was also going against the, the tide then because I, I was obviously gay and there was no place for gay people in TV and film when, when I was really trying to make a go of, at it. You know, there were no roles for, for people like me. And now there are more, not nearly enough, but I'm older. So all the people who are getting the work are these, you know, young people. And so I kind of like was in the wrong place at the wrong time through a lot of that stuff. But, you know, it made me who I am and it opened up other doors like voiceover and audiobooks. And I've been writing my whole life. So, you know, before I, w I went into acting, I was in public relations for like almost 20 years. And you hinted as you were talking about that, that you've also got this other kind of side of you that is the writer, that is producer director, not under Julian Simmons. Tell folks a little bit about that too, because you've got some stories and poems I can go read and a documentary that right. we all probably saw about 20 years ago. Right. Well, I co-produced a documentary called To Support and Defend, which was about lesbians and gays in the military. And it was when we were trying to make it legal for gay people to serve openly in the military. So we got uh, Sybil Shepard, who I knew through my work with Moonlighting, to host the documentary. And it was part of the big march on Washington in 93. And it was on the main stage there, which Sybil introduced it. And it was on PBS and we, sent our people to the Pentagon to deliver it and they got arrested. These are military people who were actually in the documentary. So we, we got a, a lot of press on that documentary. And then, you know, we, we did other things. We recently shot a pilot, which takes place in Provincetown and it's about the murders of gay men there, which we have been trying to sell. But, you know, as much as TV says they want things about gay people, they they don't. At the same time, they'll mm -hmm. find any reason not to do it, you know, because they're afraid that they won't get a big enough market share. I don't know. It's kind of strange. But I've also been writing. I've written a lot of journalistically. I've written maybe 60 articles and I've written a lot of historical pieces. And then I've done writing as a gay author. I wrote something called 130 AD, which was part of Lust in Time. It was about the Roman Emperor Hadrian and his last days with Antinous, who was his, his lover. Then I wrote a story 
more recently, which is available on Amazon, and it, it's called Math Equals Silence, and it's about a young boy, teenage boy, who hasn't come out yet, and they have an assignment to do something about how Leonardo da Vinci relates to mathematics. And so he discovers when he's doing the research that Leonardo da Vinci was gay. So he uses that as a way to come out to his class. And it's a, it's kind of an interesting story. I've never written a y young adult story before, so that was kind of cool. And I also l love writing poetry. I have a, a poem called Kenny Bunkport that's coming out as part of an anthology from Foglifter Press this coming fall, 2020. And I have another poem that was about my first relationship, which was with a British black man when I was 18. And that's called That Black, White, Gay, DL Love. And that was published by the Hawaii Review. As I get older, I'm like really getting more and more interested in just writing mm -hmm. and perfecting my writing and, and just seeing if I can go somewhere with that. Because, I mean, I can do audiobooks in my pajamas, obviously, and I can be 90. As long as I have a brain that's working, I can keep doing them, right? But with acting, you know, TV and film, I, I have noticed just like in the last five years, the opportunities for actors who are older, and I'm lucky I don't look as old as I am. There's just like not that many opportunities anymore. Well, we'll definitely link up to those to those writing pieces that you've got. And if the documentary is out there to link up to that, we'll, we'll do that too so people can kind of see this other side. Do we get to hear you do more gay fiction, gay romances? Because right now, the only things that sit on Audible for you under Julian Simmons, anyway, are Wyborn and Griffin. Well, there is one other book, which I did under <laughs> the name Ian Dunay, which Dunay is a family name. It also means uh, Danube, like the river. So I did that name because it's kind of a raunchy gay book. It's called Valley of the Dudes. <laughs> and it's based like on the Valley of the Dolls, but from a gay perspective. So everyone's gay popping pills and, you know, having relationships that don't work. I would lo I would do more gay books. I, I would like there to be substance to them. You know, like Jordan's books have tremendous substance. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to do anything that's tawdry or shallow. You know, I want something that really is going to take humanity forward somehow or another, you know, and make gay people feel good about who they are. I would like to do more of those. I'm putting it out there if sure. anybody wants it. But, you know, I've been approached a couple of times and it hasn't, it just hasn't worked out. Mm -hmm. And I think also there's a weird thing like when you're doing, when you get to be known for one character so much that I think people are afraid to have you start doing their characters because you're so known for doing that. Right. You know, it's almost like competition. But now Wyburn and Griffin is done, which is very sad for me. Not just not just, you know, professionally, but because I love these characters so much. They're mm -hmm. just like so they're wonderful people. It's like you would want to know these people, you know, you would want them to be your friends. How could people keep up with you online to know what's next and what you're up to? Well, I'm on Twitter at, at Julian G. Simmons, and I'm on Facebook, Julian G. Simmons, the same thing. And I, I try and, you know, be a good person and post things, but I don't nearly as much as I should. <laughs> I've always been good at, like, promoting everyone else but not myself, so... I, I'll, I'll try and do a better job of that. But I love to hear from people. I've heard from, like, for example, there's a a young woman. She's African-American, lives in New York, and she got in touch with me, and she's interested in narrating. So I, over the last year, I've kind of been giving her my advice. I listen to what she, she records something, and then I say, well, try this and try that and everything. And it's just really wonderful to 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 – be able to help somebody that way, you know, who really cares about what, what they're about creating a career for themselves, you know, mm -hmm. and they're young and all that. And it's like, I remember what it was like. And a lot of times, you know, I'm sure even you, like when you're, there are times in your career when you think, I wish I had somebody who could tell me 
you know, what I should be doing. And, and instead of making all the mistakes along the way that you maybe wouldn't have made if somebody told you, it's nice to have people who can mentor you and, mm -hmm. and give you advice. Yeah, for sure. It's great that you're kind of giving back that way to perhaps the young narrators who are out there right to get a start. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and, and there's always room for more. Well, Julian, it has been incredible talking to you. I've enjoyed this so, so much. Thank you. Yeah, I've thank you for being myself. here. It's been great. Thank you very much.